this is something that doesn't really go hand in hand with big data very often. Normally, there's a ton of cool packages out there. You go look up different JavaScript libraries on how to visualize data. I picked one because it was kind of a funny story. Um, there's one I really like called Timeline.js. Um, it's built by some database guys in Northwestern. It's uh, really, really nice, really flashy. And you look at step one, how to get data into it. It says you have to create a spreadsheet in Google Apps, Google Docs. And you immediately like, let down the very first step because really use spreadsheets. It's big data. And so I went and you know just came up with kind of a sample. Um, you can go do it. an LS or a DU on your Hadoop directory and it's cool with big data. You've got a terabyte of data. But there's really no way to visualize that. You can do a histogram in a shell maybe something pretty ugly. So what do we do when we have an application that we want to build? Um, this is a little more than just how to use Kafka and Spark. Um, there's a process here. Um, I just all kind of started kind of out of, hack, out of a hackathon and out of a, a meetup request. They were like, searched LinkedIn in the DC area and you were the only person we found who knew some D3 and knew some Spark. So please build an application to come speak to us about it. Um, but in general, uh, you have requirements that you want to build something and they don't really tell you build it with this, this, and this, and it's not just build software, it's building something that has some requirements. And so um, something I'm working on a lot, and I think everyone is a data scientist, is honing that skill set and that knowledge of when you're building something to, to have a good understanding of A, like all the different pieces of it, not just the code or just the, the final web piece. Um, understanding all the various options for each part of this actual architecture, which is something you're actually building. So in this case, I kind of imposed a few uh, requirements on what I wanted to build. Um, I wanted to visualize a real-time stream of credit card transactions, and I wanted to do it in the browser. And I didn't want it to be just a static visualization. I wanted something you could use as an investigative tool. So um, it updates in a fairly short amount of time. It's like be used for something like fraud investigations or just general BI or whatever, whatever happens. Um, and so started thinking about all these various steps and. You know, kind of break it down into some pieces. You're going to have some kind of stream of data coming in from somewhere, whether it's some external server or whatever. You're going to have to have a way of processing that stream. And you're going to store some data. And eventually, you're going to have a web server and framework. Um, and you're going to be loading visualization. Um, we're going to talk about some of those pieces. Um, these are some of the like slightly more specific requirements. I had to handle big data sets, so you know, on the order of billions of transactions, not billions. Um, and we're, we're streaming data in, and so not not huge. This could be a requirement that if this really went up, it, it, it might change the software we're using. But you know, 50 or 100 transactions every second will still kind of add up and, and make you make some decisions on what, what your overall is. Um, the, point, the point was, which is why I put this graphic up, because I remember saying this a long time ago. Is, um, Obviously, so if we're building something in the browser, we're not going to, that's going to be one of our biggest immediate requirements is we can't load anything more than five or 50 megs of data because it's going to take forever. And if the, if the user tries to load it for the first time, it takes more than a couple seconds immediately lost. So. Um, so there's a lot of decisions for each one of these pieces, but this is kind of what I came up with. And this really is done just by just a lot of Googling and I wanted to use all open source and I wanted pieces that I can kind of hook together quickly and get to a solution that worked. And then really I wasn't going to shift off of these kind of easy standard um, things until I found a reason not to use them. So I have a stream of data coming in. And so for this case, I, um, I'm using Apache Kafka. I think one of the best state of the art distributed messaging systems out there. Um, it's pretty closely integrated with things like Hadoop and Spark. Um, it's, it was designed from the ground up at Twitter to, to work on the distributed systems on like customers and things of that nature. So um, it's what I first started with, and uh, I haven't really deviated from that since. Um, Spark streaming is an interesting one. I Maybe this is not the best reason to use it, but I use it for two reasons. First, because I really like Spark. I've been investigating Spark for about a year now and, and learning Scala and writing Spark programs. And I hadn't actually jumped into Spark streaming itself yet, so this is a good learning opportunity. And really, it was because the you know, person asked me to build it in Spark streaming. So that was kind of a, the number one requirement. Um, as I was going on, I, I realized 
this question of how do I do processing in Spark, and then I want to load this in the browser. Uh, can I somehow issue some kind of request from the browser directly to Spark, and then get really convoluted pretty quickly? And then really, my solution was well, every time I, I get these batch updates, I'll, I'll just write the output to Mongo, and Mongo you know, has lots of good integration with JavaScript and everything, and it, I went from there. Um, Mongo is really easy to get set up and to just run with, and so you know. If, we, if this really blew up and we need something bigger like HBase or Cassandra or a relational database, then you know, we do it. But Mongo works just fine. Um, I use Node.js for all just kind of the web framework stuff, setting up a server and integra um, integrating with, with Mongo, um, things like that. And that plays real nicely with Socket.io um, so that when you're actually in the browser, you're not like, constantly writing these you know, second by second pings of a server or something that's very IO heavy. You know, we have this event based. I.O. Um, integrated the system, so whenever there's new data, you know, get the browser. It's pretty simple. Um, so I just want to talk about kind of some of the pieces of, of uh, what this architecture is, what matters, what doesn't. Um, I don't consider myself very artistic, and so I really like try to rip off other good visualizations out there. Um, what people tell me are great visualizations, and so you can find a you know a whole wealth of great visualizations and really terrible visualizations. So. I'll go to Ed, Edward Tufte and look at the Menard map and get all inspired to create something beautiful that doesn't look like this. Um, there's also really cool examples of really horrible visualizations and things not to do. So I found this cool German banana three-dimensional bar chart. It's probably the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> if Dr. Hawkhouse is watching the live stream, I'm sorry. Um, there's also always this discussion. I'm really into open source, and I like coding from scratch and everything. But depending on your solution, there, there's so many really awesome um, visualization tools out there. And we saw one this morning, like that Sunrise visualization was just kind of blew my mind. And it was something you wouldn't really be able to build in V3. And so I, I try to keep a healthy respect for the other visualization platforms that are out there. And something that's, I think, Elasticsearch and Bond is all open source. It's something you can get up and going really quickly. And one of our other database guys in our lab is using Kibana. And I kind of always pick his ear on what he thinks is good. Because he was able to build something that had all these different graphics on it. It was way faster than what I built in D3. But then you talk to him and it's like, you can only use what they give you. You know, you're in all this kind of structured environment. So I really like using things like D3. Because you can build your oyster. You can tailor the visualization and do exactly what you want it to do. Um, so for people who haven't used D3, um, D3 is a JavaScript-based um, graphics engine, basically, to create incredibly rich data-driven graphics in the browser. Um, if you go to their website, you can go see things that will just kind of blow your mind. And for a data scientist, this kind of joining of data with the visualization aspect is just, I think it's one of the things out there. Um, so I've used D3 before in my last job. And we'll, I was like, I don't use it enough, so I'm always trying to find opportunities to get a little better at it because it's, it's not exactly the faint part. Um, and this is a, another good opportunity for that. Um, this is a quick example, just how to basically create a bar chart. I'm not going to walk through a ton of code for this because we're not going to have a lot of time. But you're directly influencing the DOM and you're creating these objects that are directly bound to data so it can change in a very elegant way as data changes. The data underlying an HTML object or um, object changes, the visualization changes. That kind of highlights, though, you know, the thing with D3 is you can do anything you want with it, but when you want to make charts and bar charts and things like that, it can get a little tedious. You're going to, you know, to create a bar chart, you start actually looking through the steps. You're going to build axes and these ticks and the colors and actually say, like, where the bars are and how high they are and um, set all these projections and scales and everything. It can be a real pain if you're just trying to build bar charts out. So. You know, a little bit of abstraction on top of D3 can be a nice thing. In this case, I wasn't building charts that were insanely complex or anything. Um, I wanted the power of what the data would do. So I used this package called DCJS in the past, um, and it's really, really awesome. It's, it's a thin layer on top of, of D3 um, to quickly build charts. But what it does is it joins D3JS with um, something called CrossFilter. If anyone's heard of Square, the credit card processor? Um, they build cross filter. It's basically an in memory index to really quickly pivot on data. Um, this could give it a partition key of your data, and it does these little map reduces. Um, and it does like 50 millisecond um, speed uh, you know, pivots and sorts on, the, on your data. And it, and it binds all the D3 charts together 
so that when you, you apply a filter, you can click on a bar in one chart and it will automatically sort and filter everything else since you have this live dynamic graph. Um, I've used that before and I really liked it and so I wanted to, I figured I'd use that for this. Um, already kind of discussed across the Um Actually, one more on there. So Crossfiller, DCGS is great until you get to about two, three, four, five million rows in your data. You just load a JSON file and you kind of go. Um, once you get past that, things get laggy. It's it, you know you're loading the data at the beginning anyway, and so if it's kind of large and structured data, it can um, take a while to load, and then you know that in-memory index will will start to get bogged down. And so obviously, when we're talking about billions of data points here, it becomes kind of uh, infeasible. Um, so that's what led to the decision to use existing big data tools that are already out there to do kind of the aggregation, the processing on this data stream in the background, get to a certain level of aggregation where kind of your intermediate data sets are small enough that they can be loaded into the browser on the front end, and then you can use cross filter and all that functionality to do kind of the remaining aggregations and sorts of pivots, so you can actually try to treat it as an investigation tool. So you basically do everything in the browser short of streaming at all the transactions, because that obviously would be way too big. Um, so I already talked about Kafka for a second. Um, it's developed by Twitter. It's fast, it's scalable, it's built for a cluster. They use it for pretty much everything that happens in Twitter, which is huge. So um, I created kind of a fake Kafka stream just from a text file with you know, synthetic pauses and everything. But I have you know, something that I, um, I created a fake transaction stream, and then it, it, it's long enough that it will run for several hours while my structure of job is going. Um, and talk about Spark for a couple minutes. Um, I assume most folks have at least heard of what Spark is. I'm not going to go really deep into what actually Spark is. Um, Spark's a new compute engine developed at Berkeley a few years ago. Um, kind of a, people say it's a competitor for Hadoop. It's really a competitor for MapReduce. Um, runs on top of Hadoop on top of HDFS. Um, you do really fast in-memory uh, computation on on distributed collections of data. You do nice functional operations with maps and reduces and sorts and joins and all that fun stuff that is um, a little bit more powerful than just the MapReduce framework alone. And streaming is the obviously the live streaming part of, of that greater Spark ecosystem. Um, and so I'm going to show just really quickly what Spark code looks like. Uh, oh, these transitions here, other slides. Uh, this is basically everything I talked about already. Uh, really miss anything? Um, you know the real the real draw to Spark. You know they, they make all these uh, claims on speed that's 100 times faster in certain cases. And it's definitely fast when you're you know, you're keeping persisting data in memory. Um, it's definitely really fast. I think the draw is um, yeah. I I like the API itself. So even for cases when it's not faster, I think it's really interesting to use. Um, I like coding in Scala. So there's other reasons to use it other than just because it's faster. Um, just a couple of really examples. Um, just showing how to do the, the hello world of distributed computing, uh, doing a word count, something like Spark versus Java MapReduce, which is a, a beast. So, you know, it's really done in just a few lines in Spark. Um, and RDD is a resilient distributed data set that's kind of the core um, abstraction of a, of a distributed collection in, uh, in Spark. Um, it's nice APIs for text files. It just shows, you know, in a couple um, in a couple lines of code, you're mapping words into tuples, and you're um, you're combining them together, and you're reducing them down to a count. And these extra lines are actually just sorting them so you can see the most popular from. Uh, I have some large corpus of text, um, so it's pretty simple to get up and going. Spark pretty pretty quickly. Um, this is the Java MapReduce, uh, kind of ugly um, for something as simple as MapReduce, which is why we, we don't use Java MapReduce that often. Um, this is getting into the actual case of what we're doing here. Um, I'm not going to really, again, walk through all the code specifically, but hopefully this highlights um, also a little bit of what you're doing. The same, the, the API is largely the same. You're just introducing, obviously, since you're streaming, a, um, a time component. And so um, we're receiving Spark as a nice built in way to read from Capture Stream. And you basically tell it um, how often to kind of batch up the data you're receiving. And then um, you receive kind of a uh, you're going to do aggregations and computations on data over a sliding window into the past. And so for my case, um, I want to batch up my transactions and, and actually do something every 30 seconds. We'll collect 30 seconds of transactions, and I'll create this series of RDDs. 
normally you work with just one, but now that you're streaming, you have kind of a collection of them. And I'm telling you, all these aggregations are going to do that stream of data, combine it so it's looking at through the past 300 seconds. So everything we're doing in the front end visualization, we're going to get these 30 second updates, and it's going to be reflective of uh, five minutes of the past data. Um, and I'm basically just doing some some maps and reduces here. I, I I was originally kind of coding this up to have kind of a fraud perspective where you only wanted to look at um, transactions that occurred on accounts that had at least one transact one fraudulent transaction. So um, you know, if you've reported one fraudulent transaction, you want to see your whole transaction history and maybe see that there's something going on in the past. So this is just doing some of that that filtering and eventually you're getting to the point where uh, we are aggregating, let's see exactly what we're doing. Um, I'm aggregating all these transactions up by the zip code, the merchant name, um, it, a merchant category code, so we kind of look at collections of merchants and what they do. Um, and I do have a, a fraud flag in here. I'm not really going to talk about that too much because I didn't really get into that. Um, this is an interesting thing I learned when I went into this. Um, the next question was, okay, I'm writing these intermediate you know, collections of maybe 10,000 or 20,000 transactions out every um, I was originally doing it every two seconds, and it was actually that was when speed was more of an issue. I'm doing it every 30 now, um, but you're going to write it to a Mongo database, and then you know you're thinking from in terms of databases now. You're on the front end, you're like, okay, well they're going to insert probably in time order, but I don't necessarily want to have to you know, write some query where it's scanning everything and then sort say sorting them by time and grabbing the bottom one or something. That just seemed like not. They seem pretty fragile. They seem not very much. So Mongo has this. Cool thing called a cap collection where it's basically running tail. You know, um, you're creating kind of a circular collection, it only stores a certain amount of data. When it hits the cap, it just keeps going. But I don't know how it's in the um, But it, it always has a pointer to the last item that was just inserted. So it's a very fast way to just keep the latest five or ten documents inserted into this MongoDB collection. Um, and then at a moment's notice, you can just grab the last one and, and it's. Um, a constant time lookup, which is really nice. Um, from there, um, I went into Node, which I never used before. So it's fairly simple, and it addressed everything I needed. So I'm not going to pretend to be a Node expert. But you're able to tap into uh, your Mongo server in your database pretty easily um, just by giving a database name and a collection name, creating this connection uh, to the database. And then I'm using Socket.io. So it's kind of a event-based communication. So instead of kind of what I was hinting at before, instead of writing in these time-based polls and introducing all this additional processing, um, it only fires off and does something when an event has happened. So basically the event in this case is an insert into the database. Um, and then we're also going to use Socket.io on the client side of this to receive um, over this Socket.io connection. Um, in this case, so we're basically just saying, OK, we got a new collection of records. Um, and you know, send it out over this socket.io connection. And then lastly, we're going to be on the uh, in our JavaScript on the client side. And same type of thing, we're going to be listening um, over this port for socket.io. And now whenever we receive a, uh, a new event that's been sent out uh, from Node on the, on the server side, um, we're going to do some stuff, you know, update our, our graphics. Basically. Um, I guess I didn't include too much more. Um, I'm going to demo this in just a second. So um, the interesting thing that hadn't really been done, some of this are kind of established patterns I found on the web and it's kind of just fitting the puzzle pieces together. Um, or some of the experimentation was I had never found an example of kind of real-time updates to a cross-filter index. When you read the docs, it's kind of, if your data fits and you can load it quickly, it's really fast. It's one of those things that's a, a pretty expensive operation to update the index. Um, and it's an incredibly, they optimized it for an incredibly fast read um, and pretty slow insert. So it was kind of some messing around with um, updating this every couple seconds in this index. I had no idea if it was just going to come along completely. Um, when I scale this up, that might actually be a more legit issue, but I was able to pump a pretty high amount of data through there and update it um, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I, I have some kind of optimizations in mind for what I'd want to do if they kind of scale up further, but overall, I. I kind of push it and nothing will break and so on. Um, and then I'll just demo this for a couple minutes and show you what we have to do. 
So this is kind of the this is the sample visualization. Let's see. Um, so it started with just a mask when I first presented this, and it looked kind of awful. Um, it's kind of grown from there a little bit, and so you can see we're receiving these updates. I probably should have set the time a little bit faster so we can kind of see this really move. But it's updating every 30 seconds, and you have these different views. So you can see, you know, total spend by certain merchants. You can see total spend across different zip codes. Um, see average spend across these different category groups and so you know this is kind of a this is a completely falsified data set but I kind of set it so it looks somewhat legit so you see you know your hospital charges and your furniture charges are the highest and then the cool thing with cross filter is that, you know you have this D3 graph but now you can click on things and easily filter and kind of look around and, and notice some trends. Um, so you can see you know which hospitals these are, where they are, you can unset that you can look at the geography based view see where your spend lies, um, go over the kind of spend in the cell if you want to work only at low spend, you can filter that way. Um, so the updates, even while it's updated, while it's loading the data over the top of it's, it's been still pretty quick. Um, and so there's, you know, there's further work here, but I wanted to keep going with it to actually make it more of an actual investigative tool as opposed to just kind of a slick way to look at data. Um, I built in some, some specific trends in the data set, um, which, by time, I have it loading kind of too slowly, so it doesn't occur for another three days in the my my false universe of transactions. Uh, but ideally, you'd see um, you know certain trends emerge for certain merchants, um, and you know hopefully then it would be useful as an actual like, diagnostic tool. Um, so I kind of fired through that pretty quickly. So definitely have time for questions if anybody has any. Um, so, ACJS is really awesome because I've had that issue always. It takes so long to set up sometimes, it's something simple, even though it gives you so much control. What are the limitations on ACJS? Um, it depends on what you're trying to build. And so, if you're trying to build standard charts, if you look at the TCJS API, it's bar charts, row charts, core plus, high charts, all the normal type of normal charts you would use, it's really good and you still have almost all the flexibility you'd want. And you can still kind of reach down under the hood and do some of the direct access to D3. So I haven't found any way that's really limiting me. It's for these types of visualizations, it's great because you can fire it up in really, really quickly. Sorry? Can you make your own templates of these JS and types of charts or stuff? Um, yeah, you probably could. I mean, it's, it's open source like everything else in this. This is one of the goals. And so the guy who's developing it, it's like a one or two man shop. Um, it's on GitHub. You can go, um, you know, he's done it. The code is pretty clean in terms of having um, certain abstract classes that you can extend and build kind of your own types of charts. I think when you veer off into something else and you want to start getting, you know, building force directed graphs or something really complex um, thing where you want that whole control so we can go back to the three. It's just, it's a minimally invasive layer that when I'm building these types of things, it's really helpful. Uh, so I've done a little cross filter before. Uh, how much data were you able to get through this application? Um, it's kind of, it's a good question. I should have, I, I was thinking about that yesterday, having a counter of like the total rows. Yeah. I loaded up a really small data set at the beginning and then when I was doing my initial tests, I realized, like, I, in the beginning, it was kind of a stress test of it, and then I realized that updating it every two seconds with this like five second window was completely useless because everything was bouncing all over the place. Yeah. But I was pumping um, hundreds of thousands of transactions through. Like, it wasn't keeping all of them, but it was it was adding. Um, so I don't think like the total number. I didn't really stress trying to add fifty million transactions to it because I've done that in the past and knew it, it would just get really sluggish. Yeah, and eventually crashes the browser, but. I was able to rate of transactions through it. I maybe never had more than like 100,000 rows, but I was able to update it every two seconds, okay. and it was surprisingly quick. It, um, it, it held up pretty well. Yeah, when you don't get rid of the data, it gets really bad. Ideally, when I, when I started playing around the windows, because there, there's tuning at that level, and then there's tuning, like, obviously what I'm doing on the Spark side is pretty trivial. I'm just doing kind of filters and up like one or two MapReduce jobs. If you lower the the window time enough where you're trying to tell it to do macro jobs every like two seconds and it's a non-trivial type of job, then I, I, I don't know exactly what would happen there. 
Um, I think it would just run and then you know it would dump it into yeah. Mongo when it's done. But I didn't really break it that way. But something like two second updates with you know a legitimate window. If you're running this in real time on real data, you know updating every ten or fifteen seconds, and you'd be looking back maybe three or four hours so that you know uh, fraud complaints or whatever it happens to be, it's, it's kind of a realistic data set. Um, would you recommend MongoDB for um, data related story? Because um, like something like MySQL, it's worked well with the R, but I'm not sure that something like MongoDB is store object instead. So it has quite different data structure. Yeah. Does it work well with other analytics? <laughs> um, I think it does. I mean, the fact one of the big reasons I used it was not really from a performance perspective, or right? the cap collections thing was very nifty, and that really helped. But I wanted something I could get up and going really quickly, so I basically just Googling, it was like, I need something I can write to from Spark that has the connections already built in, that I wasn't going to have to fiddle with like data serialization or schemas for weeks. And Mongo was extremely convenient that way. And really with these types of analyses, you know, normal databases, traditional databases are fine, but Mongo is like Swiss Army Knife, you feel like you can do pretty much anything you want with it. Like, if you're running something at like enterprise scale and your data has that kind of relational structure to it, then you know it's probably not best. And if you're really cranking on massive data sets, getting into a much deeper dive into like HBase or Cassandra or one of those would make sense. But for something at this scale, like I think Mongo is pretty great. Thank you. Um, this might be a naive question, but how well does it handle like sparse data, or like how does it handle sparse data? So, what type of sparse data? Like, what, let's say you're getting like, like a Spark or the system in general. Ah, uh, in general, like like let's say you're just getting a large amount of updates data, but it's like just zero values, and then plus one you get like no, it's actually a real signal. Is that something you build into Spark to like pre-process so that it doesn't keep updating for like half values, or is that something? Oh uh, yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah, you definitely could. Um, I did some filtering right off the bat where it wasn't sparse, but I I might have, I think my original data set I had. A bunch of transaction data that wasn't limited to New York, and so I, you know, I did some some quick filters and cleans just to remove all non-New York City data. Um, you know, when you're working with Scala data types, you can you can it has some nice ways with case classes and, and the different conventions to to kind of in a pretty elegant way filter out null data and, and things like that. If you kind of just run the map over a series of option groups in Scala, and will filter out things that are not. Um, as a kind of new old trait that uh, you have other similar languages. Um, so, yeah, I, guess I, I would consider that a good deal at all. Any other uh, questions? Sorry, I think I missed something. But uh, the, when you're generating the graphs here, uh, there's real time data coming in, or like continuously, yep. or when you click and you make a request, it's sort by something else. Then no, you get new. no, that's a really good question because yeah. it's probably something I didn't totally address. Um, yeah. You're getting updates every 30 seconds over Socket IO. So Spark, you know, I'm defining a time window in Spark itself, I'm saying do a computation every 30 seconds, and then write the results of that computation to Mongo. And then Socket IO is noticing that something is happening, an event has happened, so it pushes that data. Um, you know, from Node, so over Socket.io, and then on the client side, it's seeing that, and it's then updating the cross-filter index. And then when I update that cross-filter index, I, I, I trigger um, a redraw. And so it re-renders all of these charts. The, the thing that probably could happen, and was the issue when you have like two second windows, is I'm actually doing like diagnostics, and I'm down in here, and I'm looking, and then all of a sudden it redraws all of my data, and I'm back like up at the high level. That's something you wouldn't want. So if I got really deep into this, I, I probably have it where um, it only does the redraw if you are at a state where nothing is filtered. Um, you know, so you're done with your analysis, you kind of unfiltered anything, everything, and then it, it starts you know, incrementally adding data. Um, but in reality, you probably want really tiny updates. So you know, every two seconds it does something, but it's on a really long sliding history. And so you know, even if you are drilled way down, you, know, you just see slight ticks and your first your biggest merchant doesn't all, all drop down to 50 or something. So that would get rid of that issue. Right? So on an update, are you sent only deltas? Um, I can't remember how I did it for this particular one. I mean, um, did you face some kind of a challenge where you'd wanted to update the entire data set, but you had to only update deltas instead? And, or, <laughs> I can't um, remember how I did it. Um, yeah, that's definitely an issue. Like you have to, I think I did it in a way at the beginning where I was only throwing in like the top 
10,000 rows or something like that had the biggest changes. And I think that's one idea. I think here I'm throwing in everything, but it's because of the window. Um, oh, actually, you know why? Because what, even if you you know you break down how many zips, how many merchants, and how many um, you know, areas I'm in, the number of rows at any one time is not enough to exceed what cross culture can handle. It only breaks when you try writing in the billion transactions. And so you might only have like 100,000 total rows here. And that's why you're doing the aggregation in Spark, is that you aggregate it down to the point that even if it writes everything, you can still handle it. And so then the cross filter updates are basically just you know, updating the actual values. You're not really breaking anything from a performance perspective. But those are all things you have to like tune and be aware of. I feel like when you actually scale this up to your application, you can how you do things on Spark and how you do things on the cross filter side are both like two of the points where things can kind of fall apart. In the so, so the bottleneck that you had was kind of was at the point where you had implemented the cap collection kind of back at server side and not anything downstream like toward the client. Um, no, no. I, so I didn't really have any bottlenecks then, but that's kind of I knew from the beginning from past experience what would happen if I tried to load too much raw transaction data into a cross filter. Um, you know, they kind of warn you once you get past like a million records that things are going to slow down. So from the beginning, I I knew I'd have to do a certain level of aggregation in Spark, and that your total number of records after would have to be under a certain amount. But if you do this, you know, you add enough dimensions to the data, and you're looking at every merchant and every zip in the in the U.S. and you add maybe one other type, and all of a sudden, even though it's aggregated, you add 25 million you know, groups or rec distinct records. Like you'd still break it, and so that's where you have to be careful. Is there, um, so you're using D3 and DC, is there any other like client side, like framework that you're using, like, uh, like a, for like, maybe like an MVC, MVC framework, or is it just, no, like just D3? I know what MVC means, but yeah. I don't, I'm not uh, really much of a web developer. No. Um, I think if you scale this up, yeah, you definitely add some stuff. We have a, a Viz guy in our daily lab who's much better than me at the Viz stuff, and so he uses Express. I know, I guess that's more on the, Server side, but to manage all these various Sock.io connections and all that. Um, if I made this bigger, using something like Express would be good. And then on the actual client side, some type of framework other than just kind of raw HTML would be preferred. But I just don't know a ton about that. Sounds like maybe like because you have all the other components, like a mean architecture, which is like Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node. Oh, I didn't, didn't know that existed, but that would be cool. This is like trying to get all these pieces working in a short amount of time. So like I had the basics of this up in about two days because I had a pretty short turnaround to actually speak about this. And the grab the viz at the beginning was was pretty rough, but it was just trying to get all the pipes connected. Um, and so it was like trying to just get something that works. Speaking of that, um, someone who's like new to using like Spark and all these other technologies, um, I feel like I'm like like communication protocols and things like that. What kind of tips would you suggest to like Ease the transition of using like a bunch of different pieces of framework into a big system or a small system. Well, that was me. I mean, I don't yeah. know. There's plenty of things that I, I, I know a lot more about Spark and you know, I've done some database stuff, but like I had used Sock.io and, and Node before. Um, like I know they were, but definitely not a super experienced user. So it's finding projects that have done at least a piece of it. And so I found a couple of different projects on GitHub that had done like Spark and Kafka, and then I found one that was like Socket and Mongo. There's some pieces that were totally new that I'd never really seen anyone done. So the kind of the dynamic updates to a cross filter index over Sock.io, like that was just kind of playing around and, and trying to get it to work. But if you find enough pieces, then hopefully you can cobble something together and go from there. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for coming.